for years they, they believe that the eccentric or negative contraction, Arthur Jones said this too, that's the part of a muscle contraction that produces the most muscle hypertrophy and most muscle strength gains because it's more damaging to the muscle fibers. And, and by again, the more damage, the greater the uh, 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 application or involvement of those muscle satellite cells I talked about, which you know causes increased muscle growth. So it would make sense to emphasize other more recent studies say that the concentric, concentric or the raising, some pull it positive reps of the weight is produces just as much muscle mass as the eccentric. My experience has been the extent, my, my personal experience has been the eccentric contraction is much, much more productive in terms of increased strength. And also uh, I found that through the years, if I really emphasize the eccentric, I got a lot stronger. And this is something I see in the gyms where I go to, practically no one, I'm talking nobody, zero, oh, zero does ex emphasize it. They go like this, you know, like mm -hmm. this, like this, no eccentric movement at all. And no, no control either for that matter. They don't Nothing. know what the hell okay. control is. I mean, you know, if you train that way, I'm not going to say you're not going to make any progress, but you're, 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 you're losing 90% of the benefit of an exercise. Hello and welcome. I am Coach Castle, a certified biomechanics expert, nutritionist, and efficiency coach. Subscribe to this channel to learn the most efficient ways to maximize your muscle growth and recovery, enhance your body, and advance your mind, all using the latest science. Welcome to Castle's Corner. Uh, you should get a little thingy. <clears throat> okay, cool. Hello, look, welcome to Castle's Corner. Oh, sorry. Wait, go ahead, Jerry. What are you going to say? Listen, you look like you're you look like you're ready to do a high intensity set there. Where you you know taking a deep breath, ready to go. Oh well, I mean, breathing is one of those things. It's another specialty. Being mine is breathing, but I always want to stay really calm and kind of centered when we do right, these right. things. Uh, you know. But anyways, restart. Uh, <laughs> Everybody, welcome to Castle's Corner. I'm Coach Castle, back again with my friend Jerry. And uh, today we're going to be talking about everything you guys wanted to know regarding high intensity, uh, Mike Mensfer, as well as uh, where high intensity came from and uh, what actually occurs in the muscle, why hence high intensity is so superior to other methods. So thanks so much for coming back to talk about this, Jerry. Sure. Great. Always good to talk to you. So, I mean, would you mind, uh, just because I know you know Mike Menser personally, would you mind uh, digging into who he was a little bit, giving us a little backstory on him? Okay. Well, I met Mike Menser. Uh, he was living uh, back east, I believe, around the Baltimore area. He was originally from uh, Pennsylvania, a small town in Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, Mike uh, started, we had a couple of things in common. We both started weight training at the same age, which was 12. He also started 12. And coincidentally, our original bodybuilding idol was the same person, Bill Pearl. Bill Pearl was a four-time winner of the Mr. Universe. He won the Mr. America in 1953. And as we sit here today, at 91 years of age, Bill Pearl is the oldest living Mr. America. But, but, but he was the, uh, both Mike and I idolized him as young guys, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, he was from a town called Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And of course, his brother Ray uh, got involved in weight training also. And uh, I, I met him when he came out to California. I believe, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I, I think it was right after he won the, the IFBB Mr. America, which was around 1976 or so. It might've been even earlier, but it was in the late seventies. That's when I met him. And we became, uh, we became friends immediately. I found him to be an extremely intelligent guy. And how Mike got involved in high intensity is an interesting story because what happened was he was, using conventional training. At that time, we're talking about, let's say 1969, 70, uh, that, around that time. He was doing, you know, your conventional high volume, 20, 25 sets per body part. And he did pretty well. I mean, he won a couple of uh, teenage contests. So he wound up, uh, decided to enter the Mr. America contest. This, uh, this was the AU Mr. America. And the year was 1971. The winner of that contest happened to be go on, was the youngest ever Mr. America. That was Casey Vieira, who was another proponent, uh, already had been a pro proponent of the high intensity system. And Mike got to talking to Casey. Mike placed 10th in that contest, by the way, which isn't bad for a guy who was 19 years old. You know, he was, uh, 
I think he was about uh, maybe same age as Casey, around 19. And he got to talking to Casey. Uh, and then Mike, I believe, got in contact with a fellow from Massachusetts named Dave Masterakis, who was another uh, uh, competitor on the East Coast, a very successful bodybuilding competitor, also into high intensity. And basically, see, Mike was a very, that's what he described, very analytical. I mean, he looked at, he kind of like took things apart and used common sense to come to a certain deduction. And, you know, and what happened was Casey, I believe, I don't know whether it's Mike himself or Casey, got in touch with this man named Arthur Jones. Now, Arthur Jones is the guy who turned Casey on to high intensity training. Arthur Jones was an eccentric uh, type of person. He uh, he's, had many businesses through his life. Uh, he was a, a movie producer. He rescued animals in Africa. He was a mercenary in Africa. Very strange guy, but self-educated, very very smart guy. Uh, what happened with our, uh, his his origin of high intensity? Arthur Jones was an amateur bodybuilding uh, bodybuilder. Let's say in the fifties, just not trying to compete, just enjoyed lifting weights, and he was doing the same thing. He was training, you know, five six days a week. But because he got very busy with his movies or whatever he had to do, he had to reduce his workouts to three times a week, whole body workouts. Arthur Jones expected to lose muscle because he had reduced the frequency and the volume, not just the number of days he trained, but he went from doing, let's say, 15 to 20 sets of muscle down to he only had time to do two to three sets per muscle. But he said, he, he said to himself, being a, a kind of very rational person, Jones, although eccentric, as I say, he decided, if I'm only going to do three sets, I'm going to go all out. I'm going to do it until I can't lift the weight. This is where the training to failure principle. Now, he didn't invent it. It had been mentioned, uh, you know, several times, but not nobody ever went into depth about was training. It, um, was it Steve Rogers or... Who was the gentleman, the, the first guy who came up with it, who, who actually taught him or made him the Nautilus machines maybe or something? I'm trying to remember. No, well, actually, uh, Joan's son is the one who invented the Nautilus cam. Uh, I can't remember his first name. Uh, Joan's son is, uh, was a young man who was a, happened to be a math genius and a physics genius. I don't know where he got the idea, but he got the idea to invent this particular cam, a shape. It was the shape yeah, of a Nautilus shell. And the way it was designed, in other words, Jones felt that, you know, in a free weight exercise, you, you, as a certain point where you lose resistance completely. For example, the barbell curl, you have resistance when you start middle, when you get to the top, the resistance is just about gone. Jones re, re, reasoned that if you could design a machine that applied resistance throughout the full range of motion from top to bottom, it would work the muscle more completely and if, it, and if the exercise was done to failure, you can get away with a lot less exercise. You'd get better results with less time. That was the concept of the high intensity training. Jones frequently said the only reason he, he, he came up with the, uh, he called his Nautilus machines a kind of high tech barbell. In other words, it, it gave you the same kind of resistance, but because it worked resistance to a full range of motion, it, it, it kind of like, uh, overcame, let's say, a lot of the weaknesses of free weights and allowed you to, uh, you know, you know uh, work a muscle more completely. Uh, anyway, Mike, uh, Mike Menzer, uh, through, uh, through Casey Vader, met Arthur Jones. Arthur Jones explained all these concepts to Mike, and, and Mike decided to give it a try. He looked at Casey, and he was very, very impressed with Casey. You know, anyone could look, go, along, go online and look up Casey Vader. You'll see what this guy looked like. At 19, he was a phenomenon. In fact, he won the Mr. American in 71, uh, and most of the body parts, he used to give a body part awards, most muscular, best arms, best chest. The year before, at 18, he competed out here. That's when I first met Casey. In 1970, he competed at the Veterans uh, Memorial Auditorium in Culver City. Uh, he, I forget how much, I don't know what he placed in the overall, but he won almost every muscle group. He won most, he won all the body parts except for abdominals at 18 years of age in the Mr. America. That went to a guy named Chuck Amato from uh, Portland, Oregon. But in other words, Mike Mitzer was so impressed by Casey, he said to himself, if Casey could get these results from high intensity training, I'm gonna give it a shot. And the whole concept, as Mike explained to me, made sense to him. Uh, in, other words, you, in his writings, if you've ever read Mike's writing, he would point out, uh, like he would compare it to, he used two comparisons. 
he talked about hitting a nail in a piece of wood. If you hit the nail in a piece of wood, the nail goes in, but if you keep hitting it, once the nail's in, you start to break the wood apart. Meaning that you, you, when you train, you could work a muscle up to a point. If you go past that point, meaning an uh, excessive volume, excessive frequency, the muscle either doesn't respond or goes backwards. That was, that was uh, and he also used another uh, analogy of, of lying in the sun, where if you lie in the sun for a certain period of time, you'll get a, a suntan, right? If you go too long, this, uh, you, the, you start to burn and cause damage to your skin, you will actually cause mutation, the DNA possibly get even skin cancer. In other words, so his point being, exercise was good up to a point in fact, there's a word for this. Uh, I don't know if Mike used it very often, but there's a word in science called hormesis. Hormesis refers to either, a, uh, it could be a, a supplement, it could be a uh, exercise or a workout uh, style where it's very beneficial up to a point. But if you, know, uh, 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 if you exceed that point, it's like a U-shaped curve. It starts to go backwards where you lose the benefit. Uh, for you know, uh, you it, for example, even certain food supplements. I mean, you could take them and get benefit, but if you take too much, now you're kind of overdosing and can get you know some illnesses from it. So, so Mike's uh, the concept there, and you know, like I said, Mike, uh, you know, he started the training Gold's Gym, and of course Ray Manser, his brother, was also into the same type of high intensity training, and that's what they did. You know, sometimes Casey Vieta would come out and work out with him. And they did all high intensity training. And many years later, uh, a, a young guy in England named Dorian Yates uh, started reading Mike's articles. And just like Mike was impressed by Arthur Jones material, Dorian Yates looked at Mike Mance and said, this guy's got a great physique. I like his physique. Uh, and his, his, his training principles, meaning high intensity, makes sense to me. I'm gonna train that way. Dorian Yates went on to win six Mr. Olympia titles training entirely the whole time high intensity i witnessed him train so i could tell you he really did uh, like uh, a lunatic i mean we've all seen the the blood and guts videos and i mean uh oh, oh, yeah. mike did did mention the, the hormesis in his his book heavy duty oh I did he okay times, yeah and okay. Uh, he also he would also reference calluses and you know digging a hole yeah that's and, another one the uh, calluses, very, right. very good with the metaphors very excellent with explaining things like that right. um what at which point in time was the colorado experiment uh, like was that right into the heavy duty when he first started doing the high intensity training? You're talking about uh, Mike Mansour or, or Casey? Mike. Uh, Mike wasn't involved in the Colorado so that was Casey Vieira. Uh, but that, what, that, at what point in time was that? Was that before oh, he met Mike, after he met Mike? Oh, that was I mean, after. That was after, after he met Mike. Okay. Yeah, that was after. Yeah, that was after. Because that was pretty interesting. I mean, a, a lot of it's kind of understood what like happened nowadays, but it's still really yeah. interesting. Well, um, it's that, that particular experiment, Arthur Jones contacted some physiologists, uh, I believe the University of Colorado, something like that, and he brought out Casey Vieta. Casey had in, been involved in an industrial accident where he actually had his finger cut off, and he didn't tra hadn't trained in something like eight. I don't, I forget whether it's six months or nine months. And he, you know, of course, no matter who you are, when you don't work out at all, you know, the muscles atrophy. It's use it or lose it. Mm -hmm. So Casey showed up at this experiment. Uh, weighing something like 160 pounds, uh, you know, he still looked pretty, I mean, if you look at him, if you look at the before and after pictures, he still had a better physique than the average guy on the street, because that was Casey, that was his great genetics, yeah, great genetics, great gen anyways. fantastic genetics, and, and Joan's idea was to see uh, just how much muscle Casey could put back on his body, I don't remember. Do you remember the exact length? I don't know whether it was 30 days or 60 days. It was, that's the thing is it was 30 days and it was 60 pounds. <laughs> that's okay. He put on 60 pounds in 30 days. But it was, you, it was you know, I mean, he, I'm sure he was off the drugs, you know, it was all muscle right. memory, I mean, this, right. that, and the other. It's, it's, but it's still, it was, it was, I thought it was, that was a promotion for the Nautilus machines. Right, like, look right. how good they are, you know? Right. Well, it's that, that, as you point out accurately, that experiment has been criticized tremendously. Because first of all, use Casey, who was a genetic freak to begin with. And as you point out, the muscle memory situation, meaning that once you've developed a certain amount of muscle, you can gain it back. It was a little bit harder when you get over age 60, but uh, Casey was still young. All he had to do was work out and the muscle would come right back. And uh, Jones, I actually, I communicated with Jones over the phone uh, for a couple of years. I used to talk to him. I used to call him. He was in Florida. Uh, and I used to call him up. and. Uh, 
he, uh, he, I mentioned, I said, you know, uh, Mr. Jones, uh, some people say that uh, Casey used steroids to gain his money, and he'd get angry. He'd get actually angry, not at me, but at the at the concept, uh, you know, that uh, that Casey was sneaking steroids, and that's what really helped him gain the sight. He swears that Casey was, he says Casey was constantly monitored. There's no way he could have snuck steroids. That's always his answer. Whether it's true or not, I couldn't tell you, but that's what Jones told me. I mean, you know? guys will always find a way to, to do stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> I, I, I do know one thing, though. Casey told me off the record, he said when he trained for the 71 America, which he won in spectacular fashion, like I said, 19 years of age, youngest Mr. America, he said to me that Jones was training him for that contest using high intensity, one or two sets per exercise. You know how the system goes, you know, the, they called it the Nautilus system, whatever, or high intensity exercise system. Casey told me he was sneaking off in the middle of the night to, to, to a gym that he had a key to a gym and he was still doing 25 sets of body <laughs> He says, nobody ever knew about it. He says, Jones probably would have shot me if he knew that, but uh, he, said, he told me that off the record. I know. used to do dumb shit like that. I, I would do a full workout for like an hour and a half. This is back before I knew how to train, do a workout for an hour and a half, you know, and I'd leave, I'd go home, like, did I do enough? I don't think I did enough. I'd go back and I'd redo the entire goddamn thing. You know? yeah, well, <laughs> I, did, I did similar stupid stuff myself, you know, he didn't, you know, it's, yeah, that was it's a concept see this is the, the mistaken concept a lot of people have more is better they think the longer they spend in the gym the more sets they do they don't understand about this hormesis situation once you go past a certain point you, you you either don't gain or you lose what you built there was a very famous bodybuilder who won the only man to win the mr america twice his name was john c gribbing he won the mr america in 1940 and 1941 in fact, after he won in 41, they passed a new rule that you can't win the Mr. America more than once because they thought he'd keep winning it year after year. He was that much better than the other guys. But he made a statement. He used to always say that when he worked out, uh, in a way, he kind of used high intensity himself without realizing it because what he said was when he worked out, he would stop training a muscle as, as soon as the muscle was, he used the word congested or pumped. I, you so, know, I heard that. I heard, I think I'm, if it was him, but I read that somewhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In other words, as soon as he, let's say he was working his bicep, as soon as he felt a big pump in the bicep, stop. Whether it's two sets, three sets, four sets, whatever, he wouldn't do any more. And, and his reasoning was from his experience, and this man worked out many, many years. I mean, you know, his experience was if he went past the pump, he wouldn't make any progress. That was his personal experience. So he'd always stop as soon as he got a pump. So it depends on diet and drug use and some other stuff, but I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. well, it also depends on how much glycogen you have in the muscle, for example. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the more, the more glycogen you have, the, the quicker you can get a pump. I mean, uh, if you, if you go in there, let's say on a zero carb or ketogenic diet after a while, you know, because glycogen is involved in the pump muscle pump effect, you might not get a pump at all. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, so, you know, it, like you say, it depends on many factors. Uh, but anyways, I think uh, let, let's go ahead and for those of the listeners who don't know, let's let's talk about high intensity. What that is. <laughs> off with the uh, probably the inverse relationship between intensity and duration in the gym. Right. Absolutely. Well, that was a, a Joe, uh, Arthur Jones concept. He used to say, if you really train to failure, in other words, you won't be able to train with a huge volume of exercise because the muscle just won't work. It's dead. Now, I used the high intensity system myself right around the same time Mike started using it. I used it around 1970, 71, I believe it was. And uh, uh, Jones was made, he had come out with these books called The Nautilus Bulletins. He had one and two, where it was extreme detail on how to train with the high intensity system. And I read those, they were like a Bible to me, those books. And I followed them to the letter. And in the books, he had mentioned, that you know you can't do both. You can either do extended volume, meaning a lot of sets and reps, or you can do high intensity failure. But you can't do both because if you train with true, if you go true to true muscular failure, the muscle literally fails. You burn out all the muscle fibers. The fatigue is so great you won't be able to continue the workout. I, having come from a workout where I was doing twenty to thirty sets per body bump, I have to admit I was skeptical about that. I didn't believe it, but I actually did go to muscle failure. And this, and I have to talk about that because 
muscle failure is not that as easy to achieve as most people think. I'm talking true muscle failure. A lot of people think they're going to muscle failure, but they don't. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I did barbell curls, I didn't have the Knowles machine when I first did the system. When I did barbell curls to failure, I did it until the bar literally fell out of my hands. I couldn't even hold the bar. That's failure. In other words, and uh, I could not do, <laughs> in other words, if I had to do three more bicep exercises after that, no, there's no way I could, my biceps, I could barely bend my arm, much less lift any weight with it. I so never yeah. understood the concept, even before I came across like this concept of high intensity training done properly, I was already doing maximum effort intensity. My workouts were still like an hour, hour and a half. I don't even know how I was managing that because I was doing two, three, four exercises for, for right. a body part. And, but it was max out intensity, but I would, I would only do one set of each exercise oh. because I couldn't sustain more than that. It wasn't, it wasn't possible right. to me, right. but I didn't understand the principle yet, obviously. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. Watch the guys or the women in the gym that do high volume training, let's say 20 sets or more. You'll notice that in every case they pace themselves. In other words, they don't go, they don't even come close to failure because if, I, I remember talking to a champion bodybuilder, he won the Mr. America. I think it was 77. His name was Dave Johns. He passed away a couple of years ago. And we were talking casually. And he, had, he had pretty big calves. And, you know, my calves were always a bit of a problem to me. So I said to him, Dave, how did you develop those big calves? And he said to me, well, I, I do 20 sets of calves each workout. And I said to myself, 20 sets? I said, my calves die after, after maybe six sets. How can he do 20 sets? So one day I actually watched him. And what he did is he did very short, little brief, move, uh, you know, little short contractions. He didn't go all the way up, all the way down. He did three, to ever, uh, th three different exercises. He did about six to seven sets of each. He, he told me the truth about the volume, but the way he did it, my point being, he paced himself. Mm. He never went to, told to, to, he didn't use a lot of intensity. His idea was pure volume. In other words, my calves will grow from pure volume. I don't really have to go to failure or anything like that. If he had done full contractions to failure, I don't think he could have done more than at max, maybe five sets, six sets at most. But that's how he's able. The people that do the high volume workouts are pacing themselves. In other words, they, they're, they're, they're leaving room. If they, they, if they decide they want to do, let's say five sets per exercise, they're making sure they don't burn out the muscle before they get to the fifth set. In other words, they're more focused on volume than intensity, you know, that, that's the difference. Well, that's the problem with, with the actual intensity is you can't really measure intensity. You either know zero intensity where nothing is occurring or you know 100% intensity, which is where the muscle actually fails. So that yeah. your job is just to select the correct rep range and wait to fail at the right time, essentially, you know? Well, this is, what, this is why Arthur Jones, this is why, he's, uh, why he demanded that exercises be done to failure. Because he said that's the only way to determine that you fully work all the, you know, the maximum number of muscle fibers. And, and it, it doesn't vary. In other words, you might do an exercise, I might do an exercise, and let's say we're not training to failure. You, because of, let's say, genetic factors, might, just because of your genetics, wind up working more muscle fibers than me, even though we're doing the same exercise, even the same weight. The only way to determine if each individual is maximally working all the muscle fibers is to go to true muscular failure. That's the only way. That's why he had people do that. That's you know, I would way. like to I would like to clarify something real quick. Some people don't know this information. Uh, when we say you know working all the muscle fibers, contracting all the muscle fibers, muscles have a principle. It's the all or nothing principle. Right. So it, it, it's very important you guys understand that when you're doing like a bicep curl every single one of your muscle fibers in that bicep is contracting at the same time all together. You, you can't selectively contract certain areas and, and others. It's an all or nothing principle. So the point we're trying to make is you want to contract all of them till failure. Right, right. But there's also another factor involved is that there's different types of muscle fibers. Just for simplicity, we'll call them type one and type two. Actually, there's subtypes also. Type one is usually what they, what they call the slow twitch or endurance fibers. Those are the fibers that are involved in lightweight or you know, endurance activities. Uh, and the way it works, there's something called the Henneman's Principle. I don't know if you've ever heard, Henneman's Principle of Muscle Fiber Contraction, developed by a physiologist named Henneman. Basically, what he said, the way a, a muscle, muscle fibers contract, when you first do an exercise, the initial fibers contracting are the slow twitch fibers. You know, if you keep going, 
and and you know they as they fatigue, the the other fibers take over. You know, as the slow, let's say to make it simple, as the slow twitch fibers kind of flame out, if you keep the set going, other fibers take over. The fibers that take over are the type two. As I said, there's two basic divisions of type two fibers. One of them uh, is called an intermediate fiber, meaning it has qualities of slow twitch, means it, meaning it has some endurance effects and, and it also has some strength effects. However, the, 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 uh, the, let's say the type two B fibers, if you wanna call it that, those are the uh, fibers that have the, uh, the, uh, the greatest, let's say nerve uh, connection, motor neuron connection. Those are the ones most amenable to gaining strength and muscle size. Now here's the point. The type two B, the type two B muscle fi uh, or fast twitch fibers that are called, they only come into play when you use either heavy weight or you go to failure. Otherwise, they're never they're not involved in the exercise. You say to me, well, what fibers are moving the weight? The fibers moving the weight. If you don't lift heavy weight or go to failure, are the type are the type one fibers and the type two A fibers. Most bodybuilders when they train and they've done biopsies of body meaning. They've taken little bits of muscle tissue, looked under the microscope. Most bodybuilders with their usual style of training are working type one and type two A. And the, the type of uh, fibers that grow in bodybuilders are the type two A. So in other words, so they get growth, but they're not working the real, unless they're lifting heavy. Now bodybuilders do work heavy. You know, When they lift heavy weights, they are getting the type two B. But let's say they're doing a maintenance workout. They're not trying to lift heavy weight. They're not going to failure they will get mostly type one and type two uh, A, which, uh, and again, the one most amenable. So Jones principle, see, getting back to the high intensity. In other words, let's say you're, you're lifting a weight, you're going to failure. Again, it'll start out with the slow twitch fibers. Let's say the first couple of reps and the middle reps, let's say when you get to the sixth rep, or just to throw a figure up there, then you start to move into the type two A fibers which are the intermediate fibers, they have endurance and strength characteristics, right? If you keep going, you know, if you stop there, you're gonna get just a 2A. If, however, you proceed past that point to full muscle failure, the, the two type 2A fibers will flame out, just like the type one did. And now the two type B fibers have to take over to complete the movement, and that's how you hit them. In other words, this was the principle of, of training to failure. That's what he meant by getting all the muscle fibers. So perhaps a good metaphor for this that I'd like to use anyways is uh, you got a, a three different lines of guys, I should say six different lines of guys, and they're connected. So you really just have three lines of guys. And uh, basically, this is your muscle, they're all pulling together. However, one set of guys is weaker than the next set and is weaker than the next set, kind of sort of. And then basically one burns out, the other can keep going for a period of time, and then the other can keep going for a period of time past that, but they are all working together. Yeah, or it's or it could be compared to uh, 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 what is that uh, the, the track thing where they hand off this? I can't remember what it's called. Relay. It's kind of like a relay a, race. Yeah. Oh yeah. Good. Know, yep. Yep. You know how the, you, you've seen it. You know anyone who watches track and field. You know a, a couple of guys. Uh, let's say a team gets on the field. One guy runs around the track and he hands off the uh, baton, whatever you want to call it, to the next guy, next guy, next guy, and then the, fi the final guy has to really, you know, he's competing against other athletes. He has to do a final burst of speed to win the race. It's very, very, very good analogy to what I'm talking about. Yeah, if you works, think. works, yeah, very, very good. And yeah. uh, so anyways, we, we should mention then uh, on the next subject, so selecting a weight for this particular style of high intensity training, Mike was usually pretty firm about his, you know, weight range that he believed. Um, I think there's a couple of ranges you could select, but I usually keep between five to seven reps. Uh, what are right. your thoughts selecting a weight? I, I think that's that, that would be very good for most people. Uh, my, now, with the way Dorian Yates did it is uh, he also stuck to about a range of about, any, about maybe five to eight reps in the heavy sets, but he would do a, a lighter set first, which he wouldn't count. Let's say he was doing heavy leg presses. Now, Yates didn't believe in squats. He felt they were unnecessary. He preferred to do heavy leg presses. He would do his first set with a lighter weight, maybe 15 reps, but he wouldn't count that. To him... Now, 15 reps set to another, another person might be a regular set, but because he didn't go to failure, he didn't do maximum intensity, Yates didn't even count that as a set. He called it his warm up. Yeah, then he the would follow that. Yeah, then he would follow that by two sets of heavyweight, five to eight reps that and to failure. That would be his actual, that he would count as his workout. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, so and a lot of times, you know, uh, Yates would he, when he said he would do two sets, he actually did three. Sometimes he would do two warm up sets before he'd go to the heavyweight. So you know, even though he said he did two sets, theoretically he was doing four, but he didn't count the warm up sets. See? So yeah, that's a good range. You know, that's a good range uh, to do. But uh, there is another system. I might as well mention it now, uh, where a couple of years ago, it's kind of interesting. They were trying to figure out. You know, you have a lot of older people have a medical condition called sarcopenia, which literally is a loss of lean mass with age. It comes from uh, being inactive for many years. You see, as we mentioned earlier, the body from head to toe, including the, the skeletal muscles, work on a use it or lose it system. If you don't use your muscles, they atrophy. What happens is the motor neuron that serves muscles that, that activates them or innovates them literally shrivel up. When they shrivel up, the muscle atrophies. Now, this is very bad when you get older because without the muscles, you, uh, you, without full use of your muscles, as you said, you lose the mobility to the point where you get such a degree of frailty that you, a lot of times you have to be put in a nursing home because these people are literally can't even feed themselves or dress. They're that weak. So these scientists at Tufts University were trying to come out with, they say, what can we do to help these older people that already have sarcopenia, is there any type of therapy we could give them that'll somehow restore, if not a lot of muscle size, at least strength, so they get more mobility, so they can walk again and, and move again. So somebody came up with the idea of having to do, use light weights, you know, because these people couldn't use anything more. I mean, we're talking about two pounds, one pound. So they, they started uh, one study involved leg extensions, you know, for the th frontal thighs. They used a ridiculously lightweight, something like three or four pounds, right? But they made it progressive. And interestingly enough, they had the old people do as many reps as they can to failure. These are old, frail people, right? They didn't know what would happen. They didn't know, because see, when you get older, muscle stem cells called satellite cells, they tend to disappear also from inactivity. And those are needed for muscle hypertrophy and repair. And the, the idea was, wait, maybe they can't respond. Maybe the satellite cells are so gone, are so diminished that no, no amount of resistance exercise will help. Well, they came, they found, they were very surprised to find that not only the, the old people not only were able to do the reps, they were able to gradually add weight. And after a while, old men that had to use a walker to walk, throw away their walker. They were able to move. It was like a miracle. And then, then they did. And, and, and but the key is they had him do light, very light weights, like one, like twenty percent of one rep max. But here's the key: they did higher reps, twenty to thirty reps, to failure, to failure. They had to experiment to find the right weight for these older people to use. They found that not only did the old people get stronger. People 90 years old, this blew away the physiology books because all the physiology books said you can't gain any muscle past the age of 70. People 90 years of age started to put on muscle. Now, I'm not going to tell you that they could have competed in the Mr. Olympia, but, but you know, to start putting a muscle on at 90, is it, that startled. The scientists didn't expect that. So I don't know if it's just because of, I mean, I, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, I don't know if it's just because of what I know or whatever, but that's not surprising to me with, with anything. I mean, because humans need to adapt. We adapt. I mean, if you go to space, you lose your bone mass. You go under the ocean. I mean, we know how these things happen. I mean, even if you're old, I've, I've trained countless old clients who could barely move before I taught them how to breathe and move. And then a couple of weeks later, then a couple of months later, they're, they're 20 years younger, basically. Right. Yeah, but you have to say, in other words, these people were in terrible shape. Uh, and the thing is, they were extremely weak. And, you know, the prevailing thought in science at the time was that satellite cell exhaustion, it, it, the satellite cells get exhausted past a certain age. When that happens, you can't repair and you can't build the muscle. So it, an increase in muscle strength and size is, is unlikely. In other words, they were hoping to, only to increase mobility in these people. They didn't expect them to get stronger or, getting, or, or have any kind of muscle size gain. They were hoping that somehow they can more or less kind of open up the dead motor neurons. So at least these people would have, be, have more mobility and be able to move, you know, feed themselves, dress themselves and so on. They didn't expect the muscle gains and the strength gains. See? So they, 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 then they, they looked at those old people and they said, I wonder if this will work for young people that are, don't have sarcopenia. So they took a, took, a, took a group of guys in their 20s, young guys, healthy, 
they had to do, they, they, they divided them to two groups. One group lifted heavy weights, 90% of one rep max. That's heavy. That's where you can barely do five or six reps, right? Uh, now, when you do that, you automatically, as I said earlier, work the, the type 2B fast switch fibers, right? That, that will definitely make you stronger and make your muscles grow. The other group, they had them lift a weight, just like the old people, only 30% of one rep max. That's a, less than a warm-up weight. That's light. But like the old people, they had the young men, again, in their 20s, do sets, do only one or two sets, 20 to 30 reps, continuous motion, no, no, no stopping between sets. They had them do it to failure. Again, they had to experiment to find the right way to go to failure. What they found was, again, to me, as a long time resistance trainer, meaning training myself, I was shocked to find the results of the study showed that the young men who lifted baby weights, but went, did, did higher reps to failure, made the same muscle size gains as the guys lifting very heavy weights, same muscle size gains. But the key, the key, this is what the, the study researchers said, you have to go to failure. Because what they noticed with the lightweights I'm talking about, what they noticed is that if you didn't go to failure, let's say you just did 20, 30 reps and stopped way short of failure, nothing. All you would do is get muscle endurance, no muscle gains at all. That was the key. So if you're gonna use that system, you know, meaning lighter weights to fail, uh, you know, 20 higher reps, 20, 30 reps to failure, you, you have to go to failure or near failure. What I mean by near failure is maybe one or two reps short of total muscle failure. E either one, you gotta go that, that way or nothing happens at all. Now you might say to me, well, wait a minute, why the 20 to 30 reps? Why couldn't they just go to failure at 10 reps or eight reps? Well, what they wanted to do was develop, it had to do with a, uh, there's certain principles that are involved in muscle hypertrophy. One of them is called metabolic stress. The other one's meta, uh, the other one's mechanical tension. And the other one is muscle damage. Those are the three things that cause muscle hypertrophy through resistance exercise. What they were trying to emphasize, they felt, now the, 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 uh, the heavy weights automatically apply mechanical stress. Just the mere fact of lifting heavy, that's the mechanical stress part of, of the uh, muscle hypertrophy equation. Now, since they weren't lifting heavy weights, they, they had to get one of those factors of muscle hypertrophy, at least, uh, at least two of them, muscle damage and metabolic stress. The way to get meta, meta, metabolic stress is to do the higher reps, continuous, no resting between reps, and, and that increases the metabolic. What, what is metabolic stress? Basically, metabolic stress is, is the production, involves the production. Of, when you work out glucose, all these things, they produce fatigue byproducts like lactate, for example, it turns out that some of these fatigue byproducts like lactate, they're anabolic signaling factors. They turn on hormones in muscle like insulin-like growth factor one that stimulate muscle growth. That's the key. See, so in other words, the system is again, lighter weights, higher reps, at least 20 to 30 to, to failure or near failure. And this is a very good system to use. I, rec I always recommend this to, let's say guys who will come to me they, they were bodybuilders in their youth when they were 20s and they got married and you know went to work and gave up training. Some of these guys haven't trained for 30, 40 years, but they decide now the kids are growing. Got, they, they look at themselves, they're falling apart. They have hypertension diseases related to lack of muscle, heart disease, whatever, diabetes. They want to improve their health. They say to me, Jerry, I want to start training. I'm, a, I'm 50 years old. I'm afraid of injury. What should I do? I tell them to start with that system. Start with the high reps, lighter weights. You don't need a lot of sets. I'm talking one or two sets. That's it per exercise, but you got to go to failure, near failure. The, the chances of injury are almost zero and you will gain muscle size. I should, uh, I should, I should interject here and actually say that, I mean, I, I have quite a few older clients. I actually teach some classes with older clients as well. And I can testify that this system is highly, highly effective with the high repetitions. And on top of that, if you guys are learning new movements or you're learning, let's say, the perfect biomechanical exercises, which you all should know by now, uh, but, but if you're not learning that stuff, you should be. But once you guys learn that stuff and as you're learning it, you should be following this system because then you can build a neurological connection with the muscle much better. You can learn the movement much faster because you're practicing it more times. And then you can switch over to more high intensity failure training getting the tendons and strength and everything else with it right right 
Now, there's a couple of critiques. I don't know if you were going to talk about this, but there have been some critiques against high-intensity training. I'm sure you're familiar with some of them. Some of them use, uh, uh, and Mike used to talk about this too. They say that training to failure all the time causes a type of stress syndrome that leads to something called adrenal fatigue, where you're basically adrenal heads <laughs> break down. Well, I looked into that and I was, I, I, I looked into the science behind that and I actually wrote an article in my Applied Metabolics newsletter about adrenal fatigue because it's a popular term. They sell books, they sell supplements, all to treat this so-called adrenal Supposed fatigue. Supposed thing, yeah. Well, the truth is in medicine, any doctor who knows his physiology will tell you there is no such animal. Your adrenal glands don't just give up like that. What happens is there's certain diseases where there's problems with the adrenal glands. Two, for example, one of them is called Addison's disease. Uh, Je President John F. Kennedy suffered from that. Basically what happens is you do have an adrenal failure where your body is not making hormones like cortisol. So you have to be supplemented with that. Uh, the other, the, and there's another type of uh, thing called Cushing's disease, which is the opposite. This involves excessive production of cortisol. Cushing disease usually involves a tumor uh, uh, they have different kinds of one called pheochromocytoma that are involved in the adrenal glands. But my point being, the adrenal glands themselves don't just give up. Oh, I can't take it. I'm out of here. They don't do that. It doesn't happen. It's, it's a made up term to sell products and sell courses and to sell supplements and sell food. It's bull. It's nonsense. It doesn't happen. So, and high intensity training cannot cause adrenal fatigue because adrenal fatigue doesn't exist. That's like this saying- is a, This is a huge thing that me, I mean, you, Doug, Mike, I mean, a lot of people speak on, but it, most of this is marketing bullshit, number one. Right. And number two, if all humans were different the way that people said we were all different, do doctors wouldn't have a job, nurses wouldn't have a job, okay? Like physics applies to you, chemistry applies to you, the same as everyone else. Right, right. <laughs> well, yeah. And another, another uh, I've seen this in a couple of articles, another free, uh, uh, critique of high intensity training to failure is uh, a couple of studies have found that when you train that way, for some reason, you blunt the release of insulin-like growth factor one. I don't know if you've heard that one. Now, we need, we need a brief explanation of why that's important. Insulin-like growth factor one is produced basically in two parts, well, two areas of the body, let's say. The first one is we call systemic insulin. Like, uh, let's call it IGF-1. Systemic IGF-1 is produced in the liver under the AGS of growth hormone. When growth hormone is secreted, uh, it goes to the liver and immediately the liver starts to produce insulin-like growth factor one. That's a systemic hormone, very important for health. It maintains your neurons in your brain. It maintains your heart muscle cells and maintains your connective tissue. Without insulin growth factor one, to put it simply, you would fall apart. It'd be like one of those houses you ever see where they just fall apart. Fall, that, that would be happening. Uh, and there's an interesting correlate to that I'll mention in a second. But uh, it, the second uh, area where insulin like, and this is more pertinent to working out, is you have a kind of, uh, I think they call it autocrine, uh, insulin like uh, IGF-1 produced in the muscle. Uh, when you work out, uh, you, of course, you know, the old uh, idea that you, you know, you damage muscles, and then your body rebuilds the muscles and that's how the muscles go. There's a certain amount of truth to that. But what happens is when you work out hard, you know, you stimulate the release of localized IGF-1 in the muscle. What does it do? IGF-1 stimulates, it turns on those, remember I talked about those satellite cells, those stem cells, it not only turns it on, but it promotes differentiation, which is very important for muscle growth because when the uh, muscle stem cells basically kind of I'm simplifying this, it's a lot more complicated, but when they lock on to the damaged muscle fiber, not only do they repair the muscle fiber, but they contribute what they call myonuclei. A muscle, a muscle cell is unique because unlike other cells, it has many nuclei and, and they call it myonuclei. And the myonuclei are, those are the areas of muscle protein synthesis that basically produce the protein that increases muscle mass. So IGF-1 is very important for muscle growth. Now, uh, before I explain about the connection between high intensity training and IGF-1, I should mention that there's a big controversy in, uh, in medicine. The uh, animals that have a resistance to IGF-1, meaning 
the bodies might produce it, but at the at the at the level of the IGF-1 receptor, uh, the IGF-1 is less active. They live up to thirty to forty percent longer, and and they they found that old people that live to over one hundred also have that same mutation, and they think that having that type of let's say resistance to IGF-1, uh, you know, somehow extends life. Uh, the theory of why it does that is because tumors, IGF-1 unfortunately stimulates mitosis, which is cell division. What is cancer? Cancer is uncontrolled cell division. The idea is that IGF-1 will cause a tumor to, to, to actually more rapidly divide. Therefore, it increases the possibility of cancer metastasis or possibly killing you. Now, here's the big debate in medicine. Nobody really knows whether the systemic IGF-1 stimulates tumors or whether it's the tumors themselves, because tumors themselves produce IGF-1. Why? Because IGF-1 does something else. It prevents cellular apoptosis. What is apoptosis? Cell self-destruction. Cells, the body's marvelous. The cells can tell when there's something wrong. The cell can detect when there's a mutation coming on. And what it does is it kills itself, literally blows up. It's like, they call that apoptosis. Unfortunately, IGF-1 prevents that. So cell, you can see tumor cells will actually produce IGF-1 to, pre, to you know, prevent the, the self-destruction of the tumor, apoptosis. So again, the big debate medicine, we don't know whether it's the systemic IGF-1 that's doing that or the IGF-1 from the tumors. Personally, I think it's the IGF-1 from the tumors because if it was IGF systemica, that means everybody would be getting cancer. And who has the highest levels of IGF-1? Teenagers. Teenagers secrete the most growth hormone in IGF-1. If this, if IGF-1 truly caused cancer, like some people like to say, then all these, all these uh, teenagers would be nobody would ever survive. We'd all die of cancer in our teenage years. See? I mean, basically, yeah. Well, I mean, that makes logical sense to me. <laughs> yeah. So no. So you, you see, it's a kind of a conundrum. You know what I mean? But they do know that IGF-1 has a relationship to, uh, to longevity, uh, but what, how it does it, you know, the cancer thing is kind of up in the air. Nobody really knows, but they're in animals and humans, there seems to be some sort of relationship, but you have to look at it from the flip side. If let's say, if somebody might say, well, Jerry, what if I just cut off IGF-1 somehow and make it where you don't produce any at all? Well, that's very bad because as I said earlier, IGF-1 maintains brain cells, heart cells, connective tissue. If you cut off your IGF-1, you literally fall apart. In fact, they have an expression in biology called antagonistic pleiotropy. What it means is what's good when you're young actually can hurt you when you get older. In other words, IGF-1 and growth hormone are very good when you're young because they help you grow. You know what I mean? They, you know, this and that. Unfortunately, when you get older, having the excess of either one, growth hormone or IGF-1, is related to the increased possibility of cancer. Uh, there's another one called P53. P53, when you're younger, uh, as an anti-tumor uh, gene, it helps to prevent cancer. Unfortunately, as you get older, it stimulates the aging of cells. So as you get older, it, it, it still prevents cancer, but it also kills you at the same time. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's na Mother Nature's trick on all of us. you know. But getting back to the high-intensity training, the idea is that somehow going to failure or using extreme high-intensity causes changes in the muscle where the muscle will not release uh, enough IGF-1. It'll blunt the release of localized IGF-1 in the muscle. Here's my problem with that. If that was true, then anyone who uses high intensity training to failure, should, I'm not talking about the guys on steroids or taking exogenous growth from I'm talking about naturals. If that were true, any guy or, man or woman using high intensity training should show no muscle gains at all. They'd be Nothing. going backwards, yeah. They'd be going backwards. It's an, as Arthur Jones say, what do you, uh, it was expression he used, uh, uh, kind of something related to common sense logic. In other words, it, it's, it's obvious that it can't be true because if it was, again, none of these people would make not one iota of gains. They would have no muscle. Guys like Mike, even with the steroids. I mean, because, Alcom's razor, whatever the simplest solution. I mean, it makes the most sense, exactly. obviously. Right, right. So uh, it, let me put it this way. If high intensity going to failure training does blunt IGF-1, it probably only partially blunts it 
not to the extent where it will prevent muscle growth. That's my, again, that's my hypothesis. I don't have any proof, you know, for that speculation, but uh, it's, it's just obvious, you know. Is there any way possible it actually stimulates it so it produces more of it? It, it well, it, that's another thing. It should, because I would think it would. Think about it. When does IHG? Why did? When is IGF one in the muscle? Autocrine IGF one. When is it produced? It's produced when the muscle's damaged. Yeah, it has to be. It's a repair mechanism. What do you do when you do high intensity? You damage the muscle. Yeah, again, I would think it would produce more of it, not less of it. I would too. I, I don't know. I haven't done a biopsy. I don't know. You'd have to do a, like a biopsy like immediately after yeah. the workout, I guess, right? Um, yeah. Or during and after. Yeah. But you see, I, I'm very much into science. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm really big on science. You know, my whole newsletter is based on 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 on, uh, on, on provable science. You know what I mean? Uh, and the thing is that, unfortunately, there's a lot of science that a lot of people swear by that I just don't agree with because of my actual common sense observations for example a lot of research i see online a lot of research will say carbohydrates cannot make you fat and uh, to me yeah they say that no amount of carbohydrates can make you fat because your liver will oxidize the excess really the only thing in my life that ever made me fat was excess carbohydrates yeah i've, I've gone on diets so-called ketogenic diets oh and on the flip side of that is the only thing that makes you fat is dietary fat. Yeah, I've not heard that. I don't, th there's not science behind that, I don't think. I no, mean, no, they, they've come out with studies. They say the only thing that produces body fat is excess dietary fat. You cannot get fat from a protein or carbohydrate. Now, here's the deal. When I was a, a bodybuilder, I always started out my diet with what they call a ketogenic diet. I, I lived, literally lived on protein and, and, and no carbohydrates at all, but I, I ate a good amount of fat. Some of these ketogenic diets that are used to treat epilepsy, they have involved as much as 70% fat. That's a lot of fat, 70% of calories. I would suggest, I think I ate maybe 60% of my calories as fat. According to them, my, that amount of fat, I should have been getting fat like a house because I was eating all this fat. And yet I got leaner and leaner and leaner. You can or, even eat. You can even eat more calories, protein, and fat, and you won't get fat. You won't gain weight. You'll never happen. I, mean, I should say you lose fat. I should be specific. Right. You lose fat if you do that. And 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 you might say, well, that's anecdotal. But every person I've observed, and I'm talking about hundreds over the years, that use that kind of diet, never ever gained fat on a, on a low carb, high fat. Never. Not I, one person. Yeah, I want to look up the study. That that makes absolutely no sense. What's it goes against all science I've read actually, right. and, look and it up. I know personally. Do do a search for dietary fat is what produces body fat, and I'm sure you'll come up with a couple of studies that claim that. Oh, that's I, insane. Utter nonsense. You know what? We're talking about carbohydrates now. Let's talk about how uh, carbohydrates are muscle sparing, and if you're doing high intensity, you actually you got to have carbs. Yeah. Well, let's the, the the primary fuel, as you know, for anaerobic exercise is glycogen and glucose. Muscle glycogen is basically a stored form of it's a long chain carbohydrate of glucose units. It's a bunch of glucose units attached, and it's stored in the liver and the muscles. The type of uh, of glycogen stored in the liver is for systemic glucose use. In other words, whenever your blood glucose or blood sugar gets low. Uh, there's a signal sent to the liver. It breaks down the stored gl glycogen into glucose and raises your glucose back up. It's a body mechanism to keep you alive because your brain needs a certain amount of glucose in your central nervous system. Now, the interesting thing is that the other area of the body that stores glycogen is the muscles. Now, unlike the liver, which can release gly break down glycogen, it's called uh, glycogenolysis to, for release of glucose into the blood, there's certain enzymes in the liver that do that. These enzymes don't exist in muscle. So glycogen, the point being, glycogen stored in muscle can only be used by that particular muscle. Once the glycogen is exhausted, and what the studies show, this is very interesting. Earlier studies show, this relates to high intensity training. Listen to this. If you do three sets of an exercise, just three sets, the, the glycogen in muscle is depleted by 24 to 48%, depending on intensity level. The higher the intensity level, the more the glycogen is, is depleted. Now, 
It, they used to think it's only 48% depleted at most, even with, even if you go to failure. Recent studies have found, this is very recent, apparently glycogen is stored in different parts of the muscle. They thought it was stored in what, what just a particular, it's all over the muscle. So what, what does that mean in practical terms? You actually exhaust more glycogen than they originally thought. If you train to high intensity, you can uh, uh, actually probably, I'm, I'm just a figure, I, I don't really know if anyone's ever looked into it. I estimate you could exhaust as much as probably 80% of the muscle glycogen in a particular muscle. Now you say to me, well, what if somebody keeps working out after that where the glycogen is, let's say 80% gone, what happens? Well, when the, as a byproduct of glycogen metabolism muscle, you get a bite. Remember I talked about those metabolic byproducts. One of them is lactic acid. And uh, now lactic acid, uh, what happens is the acid differentiates from the, la from the lacto lactate. Now acid, the acid portion of lactic acid is a fatigue producing substance because when the pH or acid level of muscle goes down, energy producing enzymes in muscle turn off. So the muscle's dead. As high acidity in muscle is a fatigue exercise factor. There's no doubt about that. But it's different for lactate. Lactate is not a fatigue factor. The lactate produced in the muscle gets, gets out of the muscle, travels in the blood to the liver, and in a process called gluconeogenesis, the lactate is converted, get this, into glucose, and it travels back to the muscle. Now the muscle has more fuel to keep going. They call it the Cori cycle in biochemistry, see? So it's amazing how the body has all, and an inter another interesting thing, is I, I, this is one of my favorite studies. You know, you know how they say you have to have a lot of carbohydrate to replenish muscle, the glycogen, both muscle and liver glycogen. If you exhaust it, let's say your endurance, endurance guys really exhaust the glycogen. Those long, they have like, they, they call it hitting the wall. If you ever watch a track meet, some of these marathon runs, you know, they, they look like they're like having polio. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, I've done it, I've been there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, once, if your glycogen is completely exhausted, your muscles literally, I mean, it's like running a car with no gas. It's not gonna move. That's the way it works. But uh, what, what they found is that they did a study, you know, because like the, the prevailing thought is the best way to replenish glycogen in both liver and muscle is to eat carbohydrates. And, and, and related to endurance exercise, the faster you eat the carbohydrates, the faster you're going to get the glycogen replenishment because the glycogen synthesize enzymes, which convert carbohydrate or glucose into uh, glycogen are more active. They're stimulated by exercise or by glycogen depletion. So the, again, the prevailing thought being, if you really want to replenish your glycogen, eat a quick acting carb. Don't worry about fiber. Eat the, the, even the junky carbs. Get them in there. Within two hours after a training session, you'll have a, a head start on glycogen replenishment. Now, what happens? Wait, wait a minute. The flip side, what if you don't eat carbohydrate? Does that mean you get no glycogen replenishment? This is what the study entailed. They had two groups of them. One group did the usual eating a lot of carbohydrate after the workout, the other group, get this, ate no carbohydrate, not even a single gram. Theoretically, they should have had no glycogen replenishment. Two hours after they, they, they started the study, they, they measured, they were able to measure the amount of glycogen in the, in the men that ate no carbohydrates. Ready? 75% replenished glycogen, 75% with zero, <laughs> zero carbohydrate. How could that happen? Lactate. The lactate traveled to the liver, became glucose, the glucose plus amino acids. Certain amino acids are what they call glucogenic. They also participate in gluconeogenesis. They also contribute to glycogen replenishment. The glycerol portion of triglycerides, which is fat. fat uh, uh, triglyceride is three fatty acids attached to a glycerol backbone. The fatty acids can't be turned into uh, glycogen, but the glycerol, 10% of the triglyceride molecule meaning glycerol, that can be also gluconeogenesis converted into glycogen. There's your answer. That's how they were able to uh, have 75% glycogen replenishment, no carbohydrate intake at all, none. And I'm not suggesting that, let's say, endurance athletes should do this, you know what I mean? Because they will get better glyc and faster glycogen replenishment if they eat carbohydrates, don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is, like, for example, let's say somebody involved in resistance exercise the need to stuff yourself with carbohydrates right after the workout is ridiculous because first of all, you're not gonna completely exhaust your glycogen stores, but if you train with high intensity, 
you will uh, you'll you'll exhaust more than let's say a person who just does this stuff and goes through the motions. You know, you're not going to exhaust. You're lucky to exhaust maybe 15 percent of the glycogen if you do that. So yes, you have to have carbohydrate because uh, if you're involved in high intensity training, because that is your primary fuel. Now, somebody on a low carbo a ketogenic diet, uh, they tend to after a while use ketones, which are metabolic byproducts of incomplete fat metabolism. They can be used by muscles as an energy as an energy source instead of glucose. The problem is that they're not great for high intensity training. I know this myself because when I used the ketogenic diet, when I competed in contests, when, even when I trained on the, on the high intensity system, uh, well, I would, let's say I did three sets of an exercise. The first set would be normal. I'd be no problem, right? Second set, I noticed a little bit of fatigue, but not a great one. What happened was on the third set, let's say I wanted to do eight reps, I couldn't even get four. Because what happened is the, the ketones were not effective. And I had high ketones because I was having no carbs. They just weren't effective to keep the muscle going after like one or two sets, the muscle died. So you can't escape the fact that you do have to have, if you're training with high intensity conditions, you have to have some carbohydrates that you will not be able to train effectively high intensity. And we should also mention, by the way, when you're working out, um, I mean, generally speaking, unless you're doing a really weird workout, you are not burning fat. Uh, for fuel, you are burning your glucose, you're burning your stored right. carbohydrates for fuel. You're not exactly. burning fat. No matter how hard you exercise, I don't care how hard you're exercising, yeah. you're not burning fat. There's one exception to that rule. That's very true. Uh, you know, you, the, the primary sources of anaerobic, as I said, are glu circulating glucose and glycogen. That's what's powering it. But if you train for extended times, again, mm -hmm. I'm not recommending this. Let's Weird say workout, you, like I said. <laughs> yeah, let's say you do a two, three hour workout you are going to exhaust a little bit more. Your glucose is going to go down. Your glycogen is going to be partially exhausted. And once that happens, uh, there's, there's a, uh, uh, a, a, a protein enzyme in muscle is activated. When the glycogen levels start to get low to a certain point, there's a substance activated called AMPK. Now, once AMPK is a fuel sensor in muscle, it's activated when levels of ATP ATP or adenosine triphosphate, that's the immediate source of energy for muscles. Everything, gl glucose, all fats, everything eventually becomes ATP. It's produced in the mitochondria. That's your immediate elemental source of energy. Now, when you're working out, your energy stores are going to gradually drop the longer you train, right? So when, when the ATP gets low, in other words, when you go from ATP to ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, and then you go to AMP, that's, you know, but, but that, that's just the progression. But when you go from ATP to ADP, that sets the signal for the, for the release of AMPK. What does AMPK do? AMPK increases the ability of the muscle to burn or oxidize fat. But, but there's a caveat to that. We're not talking about the circulating free fatty acids. You know, that's what you're referring to, not that, or the fat from your fat cells. What the fat that is tapped into is intramuscular fat. Mm. That's the fat between the muscle fiber. If you look at a fatty piece of meat, you see that marbling, that's intramuscular fat. That can be tapped into as a secondary energy source during ex extended exercise. That's the only fat you burn. Uh, but even that, I mean, I, I was more referring to it. I know you've heard this before, but uh, I'm trying to lose weight. Let me lift lighter weights faster. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, 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 no. It's not going to work. No, no. <laughs> uh, let's, even, let's... even if you do aerobic, now, aer what, a lot, I mean, I would say a, a lot of people, they, there's two purposes to do aerobic training. One is, uh, well, what people think. One of them is to oxidize or burn fat. The other one's for cardiovascular exercise, right? But what, what people don't realize is that, yes, fat is burned in the presence of larger amounts of oxygen. That's true. But if you do 30 minutes, let's say, of aerobics, for the first 30 minutes, you're only burning 50% glycogen. You're burning 50% glycogen and 50% free fatty acids uh, in, that are circulating in the blood. The longer you do the exercise, if you look, for example, if you do a, a session of aerobics where you go to 90 minutes, I don't know why anyone would want to do that unless you're a you know ultra endurance runner. But let's say you did, you would probably be burning 70, 80% oxidized uh, oxidized fat if you kept it at a, a not high intensity, because high intensity, the higher the intensity, 
the more the body has to go to carbohydrates, even with like interval training, interval training, when you're doing high intensity intervals, you're burning glycogen and glucose. You're not burning fat, but you're raising your metabolism to such an extent that you'll burn more fat after the exercise compared to steady state aerobic. So the net effect is the same. See what I'm saying? It's but, very similar. I, I actually think um, it's very similar, but I do believe low intensity. I mean, I could be wrong about this, but it's actually been proven more effective at burning fat in the long run. It is true. Yeah, the maximum amount of fat, what they call fat max, for most people is 60% of, of maximum heart rate. That's very low. That's like a very low intensity level. That's when you burn the maximum fat, uh, you know, during exercise. Uh, but the thing is, what's interesting also, women, we mentioned cortisol. A lot of guys think cortisol is bad. And I mentioned that cortisol starts to rise after one hour of steady state aerobics. And I'm not saying it rises to the point of destroying muscle. It just rises. Now you might say, well, why does it rise? You know why it rises? Because after one hour, you're starting to, first of all, your glucose is being exhausted. You're circulating glucose. Your glycogen is being dipped into and your body wants to tap into more fat. So when cortisol is released at that point, interestingly enough, it's having a fat mobilizing effect. It's helping your lipocytes or fat cells release fat so you can use it as an energy source. Cortisol literally is a fat burning hormone. A lot of people don't know that they think cortisol just breaks down muscle. They don't know. And when, after the workout, you know, and with, in any workout, especially high intensity, you're going to have an elevated cortisol level after the workout, not necessarily during the workout, but after the workout, you say, wait a minute, isn't that bad? Isn't that going to prevent muscle growth? No. After the workout, the cortisol not only does it prevent muscle growth, but it, it provides, it helps to break down fat, which provides fuel for the repair and the increased muscle synthesis, including glycogen resynthesis that occurs when, when, as soon as you finish training. Cortisol after the workout is very beneficial. People don't understand that. Now, this doesn't mean you should be walking around stressed all day and hoping to get oh, no, big no, muscles, no. by the way. No, no, constant cortisol. <laughs> I know, I'm just you don't kidding. Want that. No, no, I'm you don't want kidding. that. Oh, no, seriously, <laughs> high stress, which will increase cortisol. That's true. That's terrible situation. Very bad for muscle building. Yeah, very bad. Not just for muscle, but oh, for everything, really, the whole system. Yeah. Yeah, people don't realize that constant stress with the high elevated cortisol in your brain. So let slowly destroys the neurons in the brain. And they think there's a, there's a thing called minimal cognitive impairment. A uh, simple term for that is older people call it uh, senior moments mm. where you might forget where you put your keys. I mean, I get them myself. I mean, the other day I was looking for this knife I use, you know, to cut my fruit. Jesus, I, I, No, I couldn't find it. And I suddenly realized, my God, I think I threw it away. I absentmindedly threw my knife away. I don't, I can't find it anywhere. That was a senior moment. In my case, it wasn't due to cortisol. It was because they're doing construction in the area. I only had an hour and a half sleep. That'll increase cortisol. That'll cause memory impairment in a 20 year old. So yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't any senior thing. But what I'm saying is that cortisol is terrible for your brain. It selectively destroys neurons and what they call the hippocampus section of the brain. That's the area most affected by Alzheimer's disease. It's the seat of memory, cognition, and intelligence. You don't want to walk around highly stressed. I, I wrote an article in my Applied Metabolics newsletter talking about the truth about stress, how it really affects health. Anybody who subscribes will be able to read it. You'll see it. It's not what people believe. And there's a lot of things that uh, myths about stress and how it affects your health. But, you know, so, no, you don't want to have constant cortisol. Believe no, that, that's actually a big one I chat with about my, with my clients, too, the, keeping their stress levels very low constantly. Very um, important. Now, now uh, going back to your days back doing high intensity yeah. training, did you ever did you ever do any of the let's say advanced training techniques, or did you do the the rest pause? Did you do the? Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about rest pause then to start with. What, any story okay. times for that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Rest pause, of course, that was a favorite of mine. Where basically you would do your reps, a certain number of reps, and then you would kind of like rest without releasing the weight. You rest a couple of seconds, and then you continue to set. You do that as many as maybe three or four times during the set. And, and, and the idea is that it works the muscle beyond that little bit of rest, you know, just a couple of seconds allows partial restoration of the ATP and muscle, allowing you to continue the set. The idea was you're working the muscle again, you know, almost like beyond failure. You're working the muscle to the nth degree so you'd get more uh, muscle uh, gains. Uh, now, the, the, the medical literature on that is kind of paradoxical. Some studies show that it really works. Other studies show that it doesn't. So I used it. 
I found it did work. I, I, my, my guess is, my again, my hypothesis, I think it would work better if you have a little bit of training experience under your belt. I don't think it will be effective for somebody who's just starting out on a high intensity. They should wait until they have a little more uh, strength built up, more training experience, and then they can in, 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 uh, instill a uh, rest pause. I would avoid it as a beginner. It's I, too would, I would definitely agree. I mean, I, I want to stress, I would say that these are all advanced techniques you exactly. should be doing after you're very comfortable with movements right. and you're, you're very secure with everything you're doing, then you can try these out. Exactly right. Another, another thing that uh, Mike liked to do, which is part of high intensity or any type of training really, is forced reps. Mm -hmm. Also gets a lot of flack because people say, you know, there's a way of doing it right and a way of doing it wrong. I've seen people do forced reps. Forced reps basically involves where you've, let's say, trained to failure practically or close to it. And you can't get another rep and your training partner just helps you get the weight up maybe a couple of additional reps it's again the the idea is you're training the muscle beyond exhaustion you're hitting the maximum number of muscle fibers the problem with that is you got to get somebody who knows how to apply the right amount of resistance i've seen people giving four reps where they're literally lifting the weight to the guy the guy's not doing anything now i, I would i would say uh just I have a, a perspective on this. I want to know your thoughts on it. So my yeah. perspective is I'm not actually a fan of force reps for the positive or the concentric of it. I am a fan just getting it up for the person and then forcing them to do the eccentric because typically people burn out their concentric before they're eccentric. Yeah. So that's I think actually, that makes perfect sense. That's actually the, the, best, that's the best way to do it. But because, the, the reason I would say, um, sorry, to wrap, but the reason I would say about the positive, why I don't think that has effect is because if the muscle has failed, basically what you're doing is a drop set. And when you're doing a drop set, all you're doing is reducing the load. So if you're reducing the load by assisting the person, all you're doing is, again, reducing the load. However, if you give them the full load or even additional load, I mean, we'll probably chat about that in a second, or even additional load on the way down, that is, I think, highly productive. Right. Well, also... You know, that's a kind of controversy also in uh, muscle science because uh, for years they, they believe that the eccentric or negative contraction, Arthur Jones said this too, that's the part of a muscle contraction that produces the most muscle hypertrophy and most muscle strength gains because it's more damaging to the muscle fibers. And, and by again, the more damage, the greater the uh, 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 application or involvement of those muscle satellite cells I talk about, which you know, causes increased muscle growth. So it would make sense to emphasize. Other more recent studies say that the concentric, concentric or the raising, some pull it positive reps of the weight is produces just as much muscle mass as the eccentric. My experience has been the extent, my, my personal experience has been the eccentric contraction is much, much more productive in terms of increased strength. And also uh, I found that through the years, if I really emphasize the eccentric, I got a lot stronger. And this is something I see in the gyms where I go to. Practically no one, I'm talking nobody, zero, oh, yeah. zero does ex emphasize it. They go like this, you know, like mm -hmm. this, like this. No eccentric movement at all. And no, no control either for that matter. They don't Nothing. know what the hell okay. control is. I mean, you know, if you train that way, I'm not going to say you're not going to make any progress, but you're you're you're, you're losing 90% of the benefit of an exercise. It's a mm -hmm. stupid just, you know, like Arthur Jones said, take four seconds to lift the weight, meaning contraction, control, concentric, four seconds to lower it, eccentric. In fact, for, for a while on his knowledge machines, he was having guys do only eccentric only exercises. He designed levers which would lift, lift the weight and let you lower it yourself. He was such a strong believer in eccentric or negative reps, as he called it. Yeah. He, so I'm sorry, um, this kind of leads into the next one, I would think, though, is uh, the infotonic training. But you remember that one? That one, I'm not I'm not familiar. Just describe it to me, and I'll tell you if I, uh, if I recognize it. It's it just basically partner-assisted, basically, but with oh, okay. addi additional eccentric force. Okay, well, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, Mike, Mike and Ray did that when they trained together. Uh, Dorian was a big big component of that, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, yes. Yeah. Who, who was Dorian's training partner? I, I can't recall, but he was yeah. amazing. He had several of them. He had several of them. There was another a black guy who used to compete. Can't remember his name, but he had this crazy looking tricep muscle. Everybody, oh, yeah. said, everybody said that it was, uh, uh, what do they call that stuff where they inject stuff in the muscle? Cytomel. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Because it had, he had this freaky tricep that almost came to a point. You know, I think his name was Ernie. I can't remember his last name, something like that. 
but uh, that was one of his trades. He had several, you know, <laughs> trading. Uh, you know. well, who's the guy from Blood and Guts? Uh, do you remember him? I feel like his name is Mark, but I, I'm probably butchering I'm not, that. I'm not sure who that guy was. But it doesn't matter. He 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 was an amazing trading partner. I when I so you see that Blood and Guts, he's just outstanding. I wish I could find somebody like that to train with me. It's yeah. impossible yeah. nowadays. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the uh, the Omni contraction training? Do you, do you remember that one? Remind me again, what, what was that? I'm oh, sorry. So uh, Omni Contraction is, is one that I'm a fan of. It's actually the only time I'm a fan of doing any form of static hold. Uh, oh. it bas basically, you, you raise the weight and then at three different um, portions, basically throughout the, the range of movement of lowering the weight, you pause and actually try to resist with an upward force for two yeah. or three seconds for each basically pause in the range of motion. I think his, his theory basically being with the omni contraction that you'd be training the concentric perfectly, the eccentric very slowly, as well as getting isometric contractions throughout the range of motion, making it omni contraction. Yeah, in other words, he's saying you're getting all, all three muscle contractions at once. That makes sense. You know, uh, I the thing about isometric contractions that they found, it, you know, isometric is basically a static contraction in one position. Uh, when you do only isometric contractions, you only gain strength in that one position. In other words, That's why I don't to, like them. Yeah, in other words, to get full, uh, you'd have to, to get, to, let's say, a full bicep uh, effect. You'd have to do an isometric in the starting position, middle position, and top position, right? Well, so, not only that, you'd you'd have to do it in something like forty or fifty different positions, right? <laughs> yeah, like right. They're out there. <laughs> right. Well, that's also the problem with electromyelial stimulation. Mm -hmm. It's almost like an isometric contraction, meaning that it can it can actually maximally stimulate a muscle even beyond your voluntary capacity. Uh, but what they found again, just like isometric, it only stimulates strength in the, in the position of the uh, lever or where your, where your arm or leg is, it, only there. It won't here, it won't here, only here where, where the electrodes. It won't stimulate overall. For that, you have to full, have the full range of motion. And what the uh, omni contraction you're describing is you get, get the increased benefits of all three types of contraction. You get the peak effect of the of the concentric. You get the strength and the muscle damage effects of the eccentric, and you get the localized strength effect of the isometric. It's a good way to train if you can handle it. I'm sure it's not an easy way to train. I was just about to say, I myself would just to anybody listening to this, I would advocate literally using this once a training session for one body part, right. one set. It is the most brutal thing I know. It's the most brutal way I know of how to train, honestly. Right. Well,